السلام علیکم الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي ابدا الافلاك والارضين والصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبياء سيد الكونين امام الحرمين امام القبلتين امام الاتقياء نبي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وادم بين الماء والطين فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القران الكريم والفرقان الحميد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر ان الانسان لفي خسر الا الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الدنيا سجن المؤمن وجنه الكافر صدق الله وصدق رسول ونحن على ذلك من الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين اما بعد Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala possesses certain qualities of jalal and certain qualities of greatness. For instance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He describes Himself in the Holy Quran as He is Malikul Mulk. He, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the owner, the possessor of every single thing that exists. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah describes Himself in the Holy Quran as Dhul Jalal, the owner of all glory, the owner of all authority belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Qualities of magnanimity, we say every single salah, Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest. These are all qualities that show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's kudara, Allah's power, our insignificance, our nothingness before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we recognize these types of sifat and these qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within the qalb and the heart of a mu'min, within the heart of an abd and a slave, he realizes that he is nothing and insignificant, which means that whatever this being says, I'm going to do it. I'm going to humble myself before his orders. We are only great to the extent of the authority that is over us. We have children, so therefore, we will give instructions to them. We have that authority over them. People who have authority over us, when they give an instruction, our employers, whoever it is, whether we like it or not, we do it. Because they have that type of authority over us. You can't say what you want, you can't do what you want. Similarly, Allah has all authority. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has all power. Hence, when Allah says to do something, you just do it. Humility comes within the heart. Well, let me explain. When you look at ibadat and you look at worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are certain ibadats and there are certain worships to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are filled with this one quality of humility, insignificance and nothingness before Allah. For instance, like that of salat. We stand, we bow, we put our faces on the ground, we turn it right. We turn it left. However Allah and the Rasul told us to do it, that's how we do it. We don't do it any other way, just like that. That humility overtakes us, we do it just like that. When it comes towards our wealth, that power of Allah, that authority ship of Allah, even comes inside of our wealth as well. That Allah says there are certain times that you must give. Even though it's yours, I'm telling you, you must give it. You must give your two and a half percent of zakat. You must, do, do, you must do those things. Why? I am the authority and I'm telling you to do it. Humility comes over and we just do it as ibad and we just do it as slaves. And at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also possesses qualities of clemency, qualities of love. Qualities of real association and attachment. Allah describes Himself in the Quran as a Rahman. Allah is the most beneficent. Allah is a Rahim. Allah is the most merciful. One of the names of Allah, Al Wadud, the most loving of all beings. And when we understand and we look at these qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it creates within the heart of a servant. 
that want to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that drive, that I want to get the mercy of Allah, I want to get the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to be an embodiment with this creator. Hence the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to make dua to Allah. Allahumma ja'al, O oh Allah make, hubbaka, make your love. Ahabba ilayya, more beloved to me, min nafsi than my own self. Wa ahli, O oh Allah, I want to love you more than my family. Wa min al ma'il barid, O oh Allah, I want to love you more than I love cold water on a hot day. That type of love I want with you, O oh Allah. That bosom love, that deep love, that love from inside. When we look at these qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the servant is drawn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with these qualities. When we look at ibadat and we look at worships, there are certain worship that are just embodiments of love for incense in Ramadan. People give up their sleep, they give up eating. They give up drinking. They give up intimacy with their wives. Just to do what? Just to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are tired at night. Yet still they are staying back to perform salat. In the day their eyes are burning. They are squeezing out time to recite the Quran. They hardly have things to do. Yet still they are finding the little time to say subhanallah. Why do I want to get to this Allah? People give up 10 days of their busy schedules to come to the masjid and seclude themselves, lock themselves away from this world just to get to this Allah. Because why Allah has these qualities of love. These qualities that once a servant to get really close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then there are certain acts of ibadah. There are certain acts of worship that have the two combined within them. Utter humility, utter lowering ourselves before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's all about the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, let me explain. This combination can be found in that act of ibadah called hajj. When it is that, that slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is asked to put on two pieces of cloth for five days to circumambulate around the house. To go between Safa and Marwa, to stand on an open plain, people just go ahead and they just do it. Humility before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothingness, oh Allah, you are every single thing. Oh, let me explain. There is no great faida, no great benefit in going to Pel Jamrat. There is no big faida, no big benefit in running between Safa and Marwa. Why does the slave do it? The slave do it because this is Allah and the Rasul's command, so a slave does it. And then there are certain acts of this hajj that are just all embodiments of love. When you say, Labbaik, oh Allah, I'm here. Well, I'm present in your courtroom. Oh Allah, this is your bait. Oh Allah, I am miskeen, I am weak. Oh Allah, I'm sinful. Kabayers, I can't even count the amount of major sins I've committed in my life. The amount of disobedient deeds that I have done. Yet still, O oh Allah, you are Rahman, you are Rahim. O oh Allah, I'm here, you forgive me, O oh Allah. O oh Allah, I'm nothing, O oh Allah, you are every single thing. O oh Allah, you can take me to task for one sin. You can destroy me and condemn me to hell because I am your slave. That is enough for hell, O oh Allah. But you are clement and you are merciful, O oh Allah. O oh Allah, you are loving, O oh Allah. O oh Allah, you are that being. Hence the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said hadith from Ali radiallahu ta'ala an, man malaka zadan, that that individual and that personality who possesses the provisions, wa rahilatan, and the ability to traverse and the ability to go for hajj, and he does not go for this pilgrimage. He has all the means, the time, the health, the strength, the ability. He can travel the entire dunya but can go for hajj. Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying, Hadith from Ali radiallahu ta'ala, then Allah doesn't care if you die as a Jew or a Christian. Allah has no concern for you. You go ahead, you live your life, you do whatever you want, so to say. You are ba'een and distant from the rahmat and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam substantiates his statement with an ayah from the Holy Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Walillahi, that for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, upon humanity, 
Hijjul Baiti's pilgrimage to the house. For who? Manista Toa Ilaihi Sabila. For all those individuals and all those people who are able to go for this journey, compulsory upon them to go. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then says, Hadith from Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala, says those individuals and people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted this tawfiq and this ability to travel and to go for this journey. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he gave a few advice to them. What are these advices? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man hajja lillah. That whosoever performs hajj for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. First thing an individual needs to do is understand all ibadat, our entire life is to be lived for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ikhlasun niyyah. Since sincerity of intention, Allah says, Fa'budullah, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How? Mukhlisin alahuddin. With sincerity for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every act of ibadah that we do is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anas radiallahu ta'ala says in one tradition, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ya'ti ala nasi zamanun. He says the time is going to come over humanity. Ya hujju al aghniya nas. The rich from amongst the people, they will go for hajj. Why will they go for hajj? Linnazaha. They are going to go for hajj because it's a holiday. In other words, why go somewhere else? Let's just go hajj instead. No ikhlas, no sincerity in the heart for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa awsatuhum litijara. He says those people who are the middle class, they are going to go. What's their purpose of going? Trade. They are planning from now. I need 10 kurtas. I need 15 dresses. I don't get this here. This itter is sold here. Ikhlas niyyah. No sincerity of the qalb. No sincerity of the heart. We plan with suitcases from here to go to come back. Make sure they are filled. Hardly worried if our ibadah is going to be accepted in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa kurra'uhum lil... The ulama are going to go for hajj. Why are they going to go for hajj? They are going to go to show off to people. Hey, hey, Molana, he did 15 hajj. This one did 20. And they are going to use it as a means of boosting. The poor people are going to go for hajj. Why are they going to go for hajj? They are going to go to beg. Because every time the hajj he needs... To do something to make his hajj perfect, he gives sadaqah. Charities encourage in multitudes. So they look at it as a business venture. I can go and I can collect. I'll come back with quite a lot. Lil mas'ala. Hence the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying. What's the first quality this individual needs to hajj? Ikhlas, sincerity. It's all for you, Allah. I'm going to do it for you and you alone, O Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nabi says, man hajja lillah. Whosoever performs his hajj for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wala rafatha. And he doesn't engage in any type of rafath. Rafath means indecent talk. Hazrat Sheikh Malana Muhammad Zakaria says, Rafath, there are two types of rafath. There are one that is always haram. To curse, always haram. To lie, always haram. All of those type of things with the tongue, always haram, all the time. So therefore in hajj it can't be that the Nabi is telling you, don't, be, don't do these types of haram. Those things are prohibited all the time. So then what is the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying by the statement? Wala rafath. It means, do not engage yourself in any type of talk where a husband and a wife is going to indulge themselves in that will lead towards intimacy. This is rafath. So you can't even do this type of talk where at other times is permissible in this time of hajj. Much less those type of kalimas that are haram. Much less those type of speech that are haram. You can't even go close to that in hajj. Otherwise, you will destroy your hajj. You can't even do permissible things in hajj at this point in time. Just like in Ramadan, you can't eat during the day, but at other times it's halal to eat. Haram during the day is in Ramadan. So the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Wala rafath, wala fusuk. And don't engage yourself in any type of transgression. You can't hit people. You can't steal from people. You can't do those type of things. Those things are haram all the time. You can't coerce people to give to you. You can't do any of those things. 
So what does fusuk mean over here? Fusuk doesn't mean sins. Fusuk in this over here, Allah may explain. See, a certain things when you enter into ihram becomes impermissible. For instance, the putting on of perfume. So the Nabi of Allah is saying, when you enter into the state of ihram and you go for hajj, don't even put on itr, don't even put on perfume. Things that are permissible at other times, you can't even do it now. Then what about haram things? Can you do it in hajj then? Can't even come close state when it is you have entered into the state. Quran says, wala jidal. Make sure and don't involve yourself in any type of arguments as well. Well, let me explain. Jidal, quarrels and arguments, is a type of fisk. It's a type of transgression. So why does the Quran mention it separately? Because when we travel with people, we are involving ourselves with individuals, different personalities, different backgrounds, different characteristics. Hardships of journey are going to take over. Sometimes they'll want to lead towards quarrel. Nabi of Allah and Allah is telling us, don't even go down that road. Just like in Saum, when the guy comes and he wants to argue, even though you can argue and win him, what does the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say to tell him? Say to him, Anna Saimun, I'm fasting. Don't even go around that road. Don't even start any arguments. Because arguments will start off innocently and lead towards big, big sins. Don't even start with any type of arguments alone. Try your very best to control yourself, sabr and patience. Nabi of Allah says, anybody who do these things, Raja, he is going to return. Like the day his mother gave birth to him. Allahu Akbar. No sins to his account at all. No dark deeds at all. But in order to get this great reward, there is also that sacrifice that must be put in. And what's that sacrifice? Ikhlas. Make sure you commit no sins of the tongue. Make sure you commit no sins of the body at all. Make sure you don't argue at all. Try your best to do every single thing. And these individuals are going to return, said the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Kayawmin waladatu ummu, like the day his mother gave birth to him. Well, let me explain many individuals and many people. They travel and they go for hajj. And they go for hajj simply to fulfill a faraz and simply to fulfill a compulsory obligation. And there is no heart in it. Like sometimes people perform salat. And salat is prayed, alhamdulillah. Nobody can say they didn't perform salat. Similarly, nobody can say they didn't perform hajj. But a really important ingredient is to get that ta'alluq and get that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To get that nisbat with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To get that real attachment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For if you get that attachment, your own. You got what hajj was all about, getting really close and dear to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We learned with regards to salat is mi'raj al-mu'min. It's you speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly at hajj as well is that great connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said, Al-hajj wal-ummar, the individuals who go for hajj, the individuals who go for umrah, they are wafdullah, they are the delegation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِذَا دَعَوْهُ Whenever they make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, أَجَابَهُمْ Allah answers their duas. Therefore the hujjaj, whenever they go, plenty of dua. And therefore for those who are not going to ask the hujjaj to make dua, for individuals, for you, their duas are accepted. They are in such a place whereby, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has invited them and he is telling us through his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whenever they make dua, ajabahum, hence tap into this resource. If you can't go ask people to do it for you as well. Therefore, to ask them, to beg them, remember. وَإِذَا istaghfaru, And whenever these hujjaj and these people, they go for umara. Whenever they ask Allah to forgive them for their sins. غَفَرَ لَهُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives them. They come back sinless. Imagine a guest, a host. He invites a person to his house. And after inviting them, he feeds them. And after feeding them, 
Many a times people, they feel shy to ask for anything more. Even if it's your real friend, very rarely you're going to ask for more than what's present there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala invites, he is the host. Allah gives forgiveness, Allah gives so much. Yet still Allah says, hey, what do you want? Whatever you want, I'm going to give it. What type of host is this? What kind of treasures that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have? And not only that, when you are leaving, and you leave with what you want as well, all your sins forgiven, I'm going to give you a gift to return as well. Every single thing is for the hujjaj. And so they give a few advices. For those going and those not going. Because it's the desire and the burning desire in the heart of every mu'min to go. So therefore it's pertinent to those who are going this year and those who want to go as well. First, ikhlas on niyyah. To make sure that we have sincerity of heart. If it is we didn't have it before, to work on it from now. Secondly, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. For when we look at our lives, we are not deserving of a single favor. What favor are we deserving of? We have disobeyed Allah day and night. For Allah to grant us such a ni'mah and such a... That's from the karam of Allah. Allah is al Karim. Allah gives. Allah is Rahim. So therefore ask Allah for forgiveness. Thirdly, Ask individuals and people as well who we may have harmed in our lives, ask them to forgive us as well. We don't want to go and people have grudges with us, people and us, we have differences. Be it with our family members, friends, relatives, children, whoever it is, ask them for forgiveness. If we have debts, etc., put things in place for the paying off of our debts, etc. Learn all the different adiyah and all the rituals of hajj. So that when it is we go, we know what to say, when to say. It becomes very, very easy. Whatever ibadat and whatever acts we do, do it with quite a lot of love. Plenty of love in our hearts. We have to do tawaf is love. Sa'i love. Arafa love. Muzdalifa love. Pelton, every single thing is love. Love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't think of anything as a burden. Look at all burdens as a means of wiping off my sins. It's all about love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a journey of love. For those individuals who are not going to meet the hujjaj, ask them to make dua. For the hujjaj themselves, to document and write down all those individuals and people who have asked for dua, so that when you go on Arafah, at least you can mention their names. You can call out your names at Arafah for forgiveness. And when these who judge the return to try and meet them before they return to their homes. For the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that the du'as of these who judge before they return to their homes, they are also accepted. So these in a nutshell are a few advices for myself and for everybody. Those who are going and those who have intention to go. That it's supposed to be within us every single day to go. And unlike other acts of ibadah, that becomes compulsory every time a new time comes. Hajj is not like that. Hajj is compulsory only once in an individual's lifetime. Hence, we need to get it good the first time. Zuhar Salat, that a person may pray. He might not concentrate well. If Allah grants life, then tomorrow, inshallah, he can wake up himself and he can perform a better Zuhar than today. Because come tomorrow, Zuhar time, Zuhar also becomes compulsory again. Hajj is not like that. When an individual goes and he performs Hajj, his compulsory Hajj is over, that's it. All other Hajj that he may do after are all optional. It doesn't become compulsory on an individual ever again. Hence, the first time should be our best time. Should be that time that we really get every single thing in gear. So when we perform that hajj, we can say that was my best hajj. We won't come back with regrets. We won't come back with ill feelings in the qalb and ill feelings in the heart. It will be an excellent hajj. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all the hajj of those who have gone before. May Allah accept all the hajj of those who are going. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant me a new tawfiq. That ability to go for many hajj and many umrahs in our lives. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us hajj mabroor, accepted hajj. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this a journey of love. 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make these hajj and these journeys. For those who are going and those who are not going, turning points in our lives. For these are times that we recognize the jalal and the greatness of Allah. We recognize a little bit of the unity of the ummah of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We recognize a bit of the kuwa and the strength of the ummah of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for those who are going. May Allah accept their du'as, accept their sacrifices. May Allah accept their families as well. Carry them safely and bring them back. Wa akhir da'wana anilhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.